Picture this, the most expensive paperweight in history. Mitsubishi spent 1 trillion yen to build the space jet. They promised to break the duopoly of Bombardier and Embraer, but in the end, they only succeeded in destroying their own aviation ambitions. Was it the wiring? Was it COVID? Or was it a fatal inability to understand the simple concept of a scope clause? Join us as we dig through the wreckage of Japan's lost aviation dream. Here's what really happened. Between the program's official launch in March 2008 and its cancellation in February 2023, Mitsubishi burned through approximately 1 trillion yen. Depending on the exchange rate, that is roughly 8 billion American dollars. Think about that number for a second. 8 billion dollars. That is enough to build skyscrapers. That is enough to fund small countries. And what did Mitsubishi get for that investment? Zero planes delivered. Zero dollars in revenue. If you ask the executives what went wrong, they will give you the surface-level explanation. They will tell you it was just another the delay. They will blame the wiring harness problems that forced a redesign in 2017. They will tell you that the COVID-19 pandemic crushed the market in 2020. But those are just excuses. They are symptoms of the disease, not the cause. The truth is much darker. The truth is that this plane was a lost cause years before the pandemic ever started. It was stopped not by a virus and not by a loose wire, but by a single number buried deep in the technical specifications. A number that everyone at Mitsubishi ignored until it was far too late. Let's rewind to 2008. The world of regional aviation was a duopoly. If you flew on a small jet, you were flying on a plane made by Bombardier from Canada or Embraer from Brazil. Together, these two giants controlled over 90% of the market. Japan wanted a piece of that action. The Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry had been funding research since 2003. They saw an opening. They believed that the current jets were old loud and inefficient. They pitched the Mitsubishi regional jet, the MRJ, as the David that would take on these Goliaths. But here is the twist. Mitsubishi was never a David. They were a Goliath in disguise. They had massive government backing. They had partnerships with Toyota for supply chain management and Boeing for sales support. They had the arrogance of a company that believed it could do no wrong. And on paper, the plane they designed was a world beater. They used carbon fiber composite wings, manufacturing manufactured by Mitsubishi themselves to reduce weight and drag. They installed the cutting-edge Pratt and Whitney-geared turbofan engines that promised 15 to 20 percent better fuel efficiency than the competition. They obsessed over the passenger experience. They designed a cabin with noise levels 15 to 20 decibels lower than their rivals. They made the seats 18 and a half inches wide, significantly larger than the standard 17 inches. Mitsubishi believed in the philosophy of build it and they will come. They thought that if they engineered a superior machine, a Ferrari of the skies, the market would naturally bend to their will. But in their obsession with engineering perfection, they forgot to look at the road rules. They were building a race car that was too wide for the track. The fatal flaw was planted right at the beginning. It was a decision made in the late 2000s that would haunt them for the next 15 years. Mitsubishi decided to build the MRJ90. This was their flagship model. It was designed to carry up to 90 two passengers in a single class configuration. To make this plane perform the way they wanted, to get that range of 2,040 nautical miles, they gave it a maximum takeoff weight of 42.8 metric tons. That translates to roughly 94,300 pounds. But pay close attention to the weight, 94,300 pounds. That number is the hidden trap of this entire story. You see, the commercial aviation market isn't just about selling planes to any who wants them. The biggest buyer of regional jets in the world is the United States. The US market accounts for 70% of global demand for this type of aircraft. If you cannot sell your regional jet in America, you do not have a business. It is that simple. But the United States has a unique restriction. It is called the Scope Clause. This is a contractual agreement between the major airlines like Delta, United and American and their pilot unions. The unions want to protect the jobs of the pilots who fly the big, mainline jets. They don't want the airlines outsourcing all the flying to regional partners who pay their pilots less. So, the scope clause sets a hard limit on the size of the planes that regional airlines can fly. The limit is £86,000. Mitsubishi built a plane that weighed over £94,000. Do the math. The plane was too heavy. It was technically illegal for a regional airline in the United States to operate it. This wasn't a secret. The scope clause had been around for years. 
industry consultants warned Mitsubishi about it. There was even a smaller version of the plane, the MRJ70, that would have fit the rules, but Mitsubishi deprioritized it because the profit margins were lower. Instead, the executives at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries looked at the powerful US pilot unions and decided to call their bluff. They arrogantly assumed that once the unions saw how efficient and comfortable the MRJ was, they would change the rules just to have the privilege of flying it. It was a gamble of breathtaking stupidity, and they were betting $8 billion on it. While the executives were playing poker with the unions, the engineers were trapped in a nightmare of their own making. The project was spiraling out of control. The original plan was to enter service in 2013. That date came and went. Then came the technical humiliations. In 2017, they discovered a major error with the wiring. The Japanese engineers had designed the electrical wiring to Japanese industrial standards, but those standards didn't meet the US Federal Aviation Administration's requirements for electromagnetic interference. This wasn't a quick fix. They had to redesign the entire wiring system of the aircraft. That one mistake cost them two years and hundreds of millions of dollars, but the problems didn't stop there. Japan's airspace is crowded and the weather is unpredictable. They couldn't get enough test flights done to certify the plane. So, in 2016, Mitsubishi made a desperate move. They packed up their entire operation and moved it across the Pacific Ocean to the high desert of Washington State. They set up at Grant County International Airport in Moses Lake. It's a former U.S. Air Force base with massive runways and empty skies. They didn't just send a few mechanics, they built a colony. Over 300 Japanese engineers and their families were relocated to this dusty corner of America. It became known as Little Tokyo. They imported Japanese food. They opened Japanese restaurants. They set up schools for the children. Mitsubishi was spending millions of dollars every month just to sustain this expatriate community in the desert. This is the sunk cost fallacy in action. They had already spent so much that they felt they couldn't stop. They were digging a hole in the sand, and instead of climbing out, they kept buying bigger shovels. But while the engineers were fighting the wiring in Moses Lake, the sales team was hitting a brick wall. The US pilot unions were not impressed by the Made in Japan engineering. They refused to budge on the scope clause. The 86,000 pound limit remained written in stone. This is where the tragedy turns into a farce. Mitsubishi had secured orders. They had firm commitments from SkyWest for 100 planes and TransStates Holdings for 50 planes. But these contracts had a catch. The planes had to be legal to fly. As the years dragged on and the unions refused to change the rules, the customers started to walk away. In 2019, TransStates Holdings cancelled their entire order for 50 jets. They explicitly cited the fact that the plane did not comply with the scope clause. The backlog of orders, which had once looked so promising, began to evaporate. The North American market, which comprises over 2,000 regional jets, was effectively closed to Mitsubishi. The executives finally realized the truth. They had built a beautiful, high-tech, efficient machine that nobody was allowed to use. In 2019, facing total collapse, Mitsubishi tried one last desperate pivot. At the Paris Air Show, they announced a complete rebranding. The name Mitsubishi Regional Jet was toxic. It was associated with delays and failure, so they dropped it. They introduced the Space Jet. It sounded futuristic, it sounded bold, but in reality, it was an admission of defeat. Along with the new name, they announced a new aircraft, the Space Jet M100. This was the plane they should have built 10 years earlier. The M100 was designed specifically to fit the scope clause. It had fewer seats, between 76 and 88, and a maximum takeoff weight of exactly 86,000 pounds. It fit under the limit, but only just. But think about what this meant. It meant freezing the development of the MRJ-90, the plane they had spent a decade building. It meant effectively restarting the program from scratch with a new design. They were bleeding cash. By this point, the project was consuming between 50 and 100 billion yen every single year. And now, they were telling investors they needed to start over. It was too late. Competitors like Embraer were already moving forward with their own next-generation jets. 
Mitsubishi was trying to turn a battleship around in a bathtub, and then, just to add insult to injury, Mitsubishi made a strategic move that is almost too ironic to believe. They knew that even if they built the space jet, they had no support network, they had no mechanics in America to fix the planes, they had no supply chain. So, in June 2020, they bought the competition. Mitsubishi paid $550 million to acquire the CRJ program from Bombardier. This deal gave them maintenance facilities in Montreal and Toronto and a global support network. But look at what this actually accomplished. Bombardier wanted to get out of the commercial aviation business. They were losing money. Mitsubishi effectively wrote them a check to help them exit the market gracefully. With Bombardier gone, the field was left to just two players, Mitsubishi and Embraer. But Mitsubishi didn't have a working plane. So, by paying Bombardier to leave, they handed a total monopoly to Embraer. Embraer's E-175 jet fits the scope clause perfectly. It has over 80% of the market share for that size of aircraft. While Mitsubishi was struggling to certify a paper plane, Embraer was delivering real jets to the very customers Mitsubishi wanted. The final blow came from the outside world. In early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the globe. Air travel plummeted by 60%. Airlines parked their fleets. No one was ordering new planes. For a healthy company, this would have been a crisis. For the space jet program, which was already on life support, it was a knockout blow. In October 2020, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries announced they were pausing the space jet development. They slashed the budget by 95%. They laid off half of their employees. The lights went out in Moses Lake. The Japanese engineers packed their bags and went home. Little Tokyo became a ghost town. Finally, in February 2023, the inevitable happened. Mitsubishi officially cancelled the program. The final tally? 1 trillion yen spent, zero aircraft certified, zero aircraft delivered. It was a total loss. So, how do we explain this? How does a nation with the engineering prowess of Japan fail so spectacularly? There is a term for this in Japanese business, Galapagos Syndrome. It refers to the Galapagos Islands, where species evolved in total isolation from the rest of the world. In business, it describes Japanese products that are highly advanced and optimized for the domestic market, but completely incompatible with global standards. We saw it with the Galapagos phones of the early 2000s, Japanese flip phones that had TV tuners and payment chips years before the iPhone, but couldn't be sold outside Japan. The space jet was a Galapagos plane. The engineers at Mitsubishi were obsessed with technical perfection. They focused on the manufacturing tolerances, the carbon fiber weaves, the aerodynamic efficiency. They wanted to build the perfect machine, but they ignored the messy political reality of the global market. They ignored the unions. They ignored the regulations. They let their national pride prevent them from asking for help or bringing in foreign experts who understood the US certification process until it was far too late. They thought that engineering excellence was enough to win, but in the high-stakes world of aerospace, engineering is only half the battle. If you can't navigate the politics, your plane stays on the ground, which brings us back to that image in the desert. In March 2023, the destruction began. Footage emerged from Moses Lake, showing the excavators at work. They were tearing apart the flight test aircraft, including JA-21MJ, the very first plane to fly in 2015. You can see the hydraulic shears cutting through the wings. You can see the fuselage being crushed like a soda can. These weren't old planes. They were brand new prototypes loaded with advanced avionics and materials. They were worth millions. But as scrap metal, they were worth just a few thousand dollars. It is a visceral painful sight. It is the physical manifestation of $8 billion being set on fire. The irony of this story is that the world actually needs this plane. Right now, the United States is facing a massive shortage of regional jets. The pilot shortage is acute, with projections of 10,000 missing pilots by 2030. Airlines are desperate for modern, efficient aircraft to keep their networks running. The market gap that Mitsubishi identified in 2008 is still there. In fact, it is bigger than ever, but Mitsubishi isn't there to fill it. The space jet is gone. Instead, the sky belongs to Embraer. The Brazilian manufacturer is delivering the E-175 as fast as they can build it. They won the war not because they had better carbon fiber or quieter engines, but because they built a plane that was legal to fly. The space jet serves as a brutal lesson for the entire industry. 
You can have the biggest budget in the world, you can have the smartest engineers, you can have the backing of a powerful government, but if you don't respect the market, the market will destroy you. Check out another video here.